Hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us today for this very important presentation on reducing, preventing, managing project claims and disputes. Whether you are a seasoned professional, project manager, a team member, maybe an owner or a contractor, this topic is very important for you to ensure project success. Uh, most people see uh, disputes are inevitable. And of course, it is to a certain extent. And it has a major impact on the harmony within the team. I have actually very good news for you today that those disputes and those claims are not only manageable, but they are also preventable to a certain extent. So today we're going to delve deep into several strategies and best practices that will help you have a much better control over your project. A uh, very quick overview of my bio. I'm a civil engineer. I got my PhD from uh, U of C many years ago. I have 45 years of experience, uh, combined experience, actually, project management and teaching experience. I, I started my career as a contractor, and then I moved. I saw the light, <laughs> and I moved to be an owner rep for about 30 years with Public Works. And then I have been a consultant on my own for about 15 years or so. I handled or worked in uh, many project deliverable, delivery systems, uh, all kinds of contracts and procurement systems. I worked as a claim consultant for about five years. I taught project management, risk management, construction management at U of A for 10 years. I have lots of courses uh, developed over the years. I teach, coach, uh, mentor, and so on. I have been working with Procept for almost seven years now. And I also work with Edmonton Construction Association on a regular basis. Let me start very quickly uh, with a few advertising. I do offer PMP exam delivery, uh, basically course three times a year. Uh, I'm going to give you next year because I'll, this year is almost full. Uh, January, April, and September. Please check or watch Procept uh, website for the exact date. The course is basically six days, uh, one day as an introduction and five days according to PMI. Uh, it's eight, six Saturdays, start at 10.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Toronto time. I actually have it here in Edmonton. I'm in Edmonton, uh, starting at 8.30, so your time. The course is divided into 12 sessions, each is three and a half hour sessions. Uh, one Saturday every uh, second Saturday. So basically two Saturdays a month. The course takes about six uh, six days, which may be uh, basically three months. So you can be a PMP within three months. Uh, the course is offered online uh, on Zoom. And I have a very good guided study program that will ensure your success and your passing the exam from the first trial for sure i also have a refresher course for those of you that took my course or similar course uh, and did not write the exam for whatever reason here is a refresher course it's only two days and uh, basically it does uh, cover the most important and most critical issues in the PMP exam. 
I also offer, and it's, it's offer again three times a year, as you can see, February, March, and November. Again, watch those dates in ProSAP website. I also offer uh, courses with Edmonton Construction Association. This course uh, here, Construction Disputes Prevention and Resolution, is a two-day course. Actually, it's coming up on October 5 and 6. So if you are interested, if you like what you see today, you are welcome to join us. There is room there. I also have building quality in construction projects in November 2nd and 3rd. This is a very good course that will allow you to deliver a quality product at the end of the day. So by the end of this presentation, my goal is uh, for you is to leave with a comprehensive understanding of project claims and dispute. As much as we can, of course, within one hour. As I said, this course is basically a condensed 14-hour uh, of presentation. So it, it's hard. To put it together, but you will get the taste of it anyway. Uh, you will be armed with practical tools, knowledge, technique, best practices to reduce claims and disputes for sure. So let's now embark on the journey to uncover some secrets to reducing, preventing the construction disputes. Please feel free to connect with me through any way you want it. Uh, you can raise your hand, you can write a note, and hopefully I can have time to read them. If not, I'll have some time at the very end of the presentation where you can speak up and we'll talk. Okay. So let's start with a very important definition. What is a claim? I'm going to give you a minute or half a minute to read those two definitions. Okay, as you can see, the first definition by American Institute for Architects. And basically it says a demand or assertion by one of the parties seeking as a matter of right, a payment of money or other relief with respect to the terms of the contract. So, very important point here is a claim has to relate to an existing contract. There is no contract, there is no claim. You can't have a claim without having a contract. Okay? A request for additional compensation for damages or expenses incurred during the performance of the contract as a result of an event or a condition that is not part of the contract. You have a contract, but something happened and it is not covered in the contract. Then you can also claim it as because it, you are actually doing it. So both of them refer to a contract. You must have a contract, then you can have a claim. Here are some characteristics of a claim. The claim occur after the contract is awarded. During the tendering period, there is no claim. You cannot have a claim. It has to be unanticipated. You cannot, during the tendering period, say, okay, I'm gonna leave this so we can have a claim. I think it is our responsibility as contractors or consultant, if you see something in the contract that may raise a claim, you need to bring it to the owner attention 
uh, basically in the pre-construction meeting or whatever. Uh, the claim has to uh, basically uh, uh, relate to a cost or a method of performance uh, or a procedure that relate to the contract. The claim has to cause a damage or impact on you as a contractor or an owner. You can't just claim for the sake of claiming. I suffered something whatever that is, and I need compensation. This has to relate to a contract, okay? Uh, again, usually the claim is caused by ambiguity, error, omission, or whatever. Claims are actually unique. I want to highlight the importance of that most claims are preventable. I work in a field of claims for many years and I always ask the people, do you think that is, or that particular claim could have been prevented? Said, yes, if we did one, two, one, two, three. Okay. I want to also to remember that a large number of claims originate at the beginning of the project, and especially in the design phase. So please pay attention to that. Maybe one suggestion I give it to many owners is involve a claim consultant during the design of the project. Then he can highlight the gray areas that may cause a claim and as a result, you will be able to have a smoother ride to your construction. Of course, the claim is situational. You need to have documentation to prove that you have a claim, and so on. Again, I just want to focus. Most common types of claims originate during the design phase. So please, owners, pay a lot of attention owners and contractors and also architects pay a lot of attention to the design stage of the project so we talked about claims now what's a dispute a dispute is a disagreement over the existence responsibility or cost of a claim Okay, so you can have a dispute and then the owner say, oh, that, I don't think so. No, you don't have a claim. So, or, yes, there is a claim, but that's not my responsibility. It is somebody else. It's your responsibility as a contract. Or, if the cost is very high, I don't think that this claim warrant that much money so now we have a dispute so a dispute is a disagreement with whatever type of disagreement related to a claim okay so unacceptable claim by one party is a cause of a dispute so how does this thing start anyway the whole issue start or the whole claim dispute starts with an issue. An issue is basically something that needs attention by owner, by a project manager, by contractor, whatever it is. If you don't attend to that issue, it becomes a problem. If you don't look after that problem, now it becomes a claim. And if a claim is not addressed, somehow it becomes a dispute. So in order for you or me or anybody to basically prevent or reduce disputes, 
you need to start with reducing or preventing the issues. Or if you have an issue, you need to look after it. Here are some examples of an issue that comes up and basically causes problems, claims, and finally disputes. So I'm going to leave that with you to think about. So our goal is basically working with claims to resolve them before they become dispute. Unfortunately, contractors and owners have different views on the claim. The owner may think, I don't think that is a change. The owner says, it is a change. Okay. Did the change actually happen or not? Who is responsible for that claim? Or who is responsible for that change? Or who is responsible for that activity that caused an issue? Is the cost excessive? Is the cost normal? Again, what is the impact on the schedule? That should not be an impact on the schedule. Maybe you can absorb that in your uh, schedule or float and so on. So all those issues need to be basically discussed. So failure to resolve contractor claim early, here is the key word, early, is very often leads to disputes against the owner for larger sums of money. This is very critical. That has been my experience all my life in construction. The claim starts very small. And then it, I, at one time, I remember, uh, working with a project in Regina where the contractor submitted a claim for soil conditions. And he, yeah, he, the claim was reasonable, uh, about 140,000 or something like that. I looked at it and said, Mr. Owner, this looks fine. I think we should pay it. He said, no, I'm not gonna pay. I don't see there's a claim. So I told him, look, if you are not gonna pay it, it will cost you three times as much. He insisted not to consider it. Of course, the contractor went to a consultant and the consultant, uh, a claim consultant, actually, unfortunately, blew it out of proportion and he submitted the claim for $350,000. And then the owner woke up. Anyway, it's a long story. So owners, Please be realistic, be responsible. If there is an issue with it, discuss it, but don't say no claim. So after this long introduction, let us get into the prevention part. As we all know, prevention is better than cure. Prevention is better than cure. Okay, the first step is owner and contractor attitude toward each other. This is a major cause of misunderstanding and that will lead to issues, claims, problems, and disputes. So the first step is have reasonable expectations from each other. That is so critical and so important. Make sure as an owner, you don't expect the contractor to be perfect. Don't expect a perfect job because that does not exist. Expect excellence. Again, you need to trust each other, which unfortunately I do not see it in many construction operations. It's always people directing uh, blame towards the other person rather than understanding where the issues are coming from. Partnering a team member, you know, 
team building is great idea. Support each other goal. The goal, understand each other goal. That's very important. As an owner, my goal is to have a reasonable job done in a reasonable time. The contractor owners need to recognize that contractors are in business to make money. They need to also recognize that time is very critical to the contractors. So make sure that you understand that issue. Contractor is in business to make money. Again, how much money? That may be the issue. Okay. Uh, again, those people involved in the construction need to have good management skills. As an owner, be firm but fair. Make sure that you address issues in a timely fashion. This will reduce so many claims. I can assure you of that. Another area that related to this is the owner responsibility. As an owner, if you carry out your responsibilities on a, a, in, a, in a reasonable manner, you will reduce quite a bit of disputes. Uh, owner must fulfill their obligation and work together with the contractor to keep issues, problems, from becoming claims and disputes. Work together, folks. Communicate. Talk face to face rather than sending letters back and forth that people may misunderstand. Very important. Make sure that you have access to the site to the, for the contract. On time access is very important. As a contractor, I have my schedule ready. And I wanted to start. Owner site is not ready. That is a big issue. Make sure that we have enough lay uh, down area or staging area for the contract. Finally, number five, respond in a timely manner. At least let them know that you are working on the issue. If the contractor send you a request for information or request for uh, any anything, respond, say, I'm working on it, rather than wait until you get the results. Major issue is expectation management. If you leave it up to the other party, they will make an assumption. And based on that assumptions, you make decisions. And guess what? It doesn't work that way. Another area that I wanted to reinforce is contractor responsibility. Make sure that your people have adequate training and they are competent project managers and superintendent. Make sure that you share problems with the owner as early as you can. Let them know the best way is at the very beginning of the project. And the startup meeting, review the drawings and the spec beforehand and bring all those issues during the startup meeting. This is the way I operate and it, it actually Uh, enforces better understanding and better relationship with the owner and the contract. Make sure that the site and the office work together. Many times we see the site working independently on the office, and that is not a good sign. Make sure that you involve the subcontractor in developing the schedule. I have seen so many general contractors submit their schedule without considering the subtrade, and that creates 
problems. I can tell you that for sure. So that's number one. Relationship between owner and contractor, communication, expectation management, do what you're supposed to do, understand your roles and responsibilities. Number two, improve communication between owner, contractor, and consultant. This is a biggie. Try to have some seamless communication between the team. Try to break down the traditional barriers between owner, contractor, and consultant. Let's work as a team. Let us understand each other role and responsibilities. Let's make sure that we have reasonable expectations from each other. Make sure as a contractor, you have an understanding where is the owner coming from. Remember the owner represent the users and he is conveying the user's use, the people that would be using the building. And this is one of my suggestions is to include the users. Make sure that you include the operating and maintenance people in the front end of the project. One of the things that I do when I, I, I don't basically uh, do projects now, but based on my so many experience, uh, you know, issues really come from uh, the maintenance people, the operating and maintenance people later on. They are not happy. And of course, they make the owner project manager life miserable as well. Another very important issue related to communication is making decisions. As an owner, make sure that you make decisions quick because the contractor is depending on that. Another thing that is very important, take a proactive role in preventing issue. Try to look ahead. Looking at this situation, I see a problem in this area. Let us discuss it. And that's the whole purpose of having a weekly meeting is to prevent risk management, look ahead, predict issues, and try to resolve them early where you can have time to resolve them rather than waiting until the last meeting and then. I need an answer by this afternoon. I, I have seen that so many times. As a superintendent, he calls me and says, I need an answer by this afternoon because the, you know, the equipment are standing still. Yeah, but I have, I, I don't make decisions on my own. Contractors, please understand that. When you contact the owner, representative, or project manager, he has to, he doesn't make decisions on his own. He has to go back to the users, something maybe reflect the operating and maintenance people, something else reflect the sponsor with money and all those issues. So I need to talk to three or four people. So it does take some time to make a decision. And maybe that decision has to go a level higher as well. So please make sure that this is happening and you try to prevent those claims from happening as early as you can. Another very important area for the owner is to make sure he has the right consultant that will produce quality plans and spec. As I said earlier this morning, uh, basically most of the issues comes early in the project. 
and specifically from the design. Make sure that you use precise language for the spec and the drawings. Make sure that it's easy to understand. Avoid phrase. I remember talking was uh, uh, subject to the city project manager decision or subject to the engineer decision. You know, in federal government, they say subject to the engineer decision. So what kind of decision? How quickly will he make that decision? And so on. Those are very vague words. As will be decided by the engineer. So if I'm bidding on that job, which way should I go? You are putting things up in the air. That, that doesn't mean too much. It creates confusion. So make sure that things are specific. Okay. Another very important issue for us as project manager for the owner, if the specification is not specific, how can I enforce it? You can't enforce it. You need to have specific requirement. Then it is clear and I can enforce it as a project manager. So if the above is not there, that will create major issues during tendering and during execution of the contract. So please try to review the drawings and the spec thoroughly before you go out to tender. Make sure you hire somebody claim consultant or whatever to review the claim, uh, review the spec and the drawings and make sure that things are clear. Let's move on. Another very good advice, and I have done that for years, early involvement of contractors in a traditional sense where design, bid, build. The best way is to involve contractors. When you have a contractor involved, it makes a world of difference. The contractor will ensure constructability, making sure that people can build it. I remember uh, having a project and the contractor called me and said, Sammy, can you come and tell me how do I put this section together i said mm, that's a good question let me ask the architect so i asked the architect i said how do you put that question uh, that uh, section together or detail together he said oh i don't know let me ask a drafts person and he talked to the head drafts person and finally we get to the drafts person and said i don't know i said oh thank you so make sure that the Drafts people are experienced. They know what they are doing. And somebody, like a head drafts person or whatever, reviews those drawings before we send them out. Okay. Make sure that there is communication between the contractor and the consultant and the designer before putting things out for tender. Some people will say, oh, that's not fair. Usually if you involve contractor A in the design, he will have uh, insider information about the project and whether that is an advantage or a disadvantage. I went through that about uh, 25, 30 years ago, and I involved with the construction association, and they did a survey uh, with uh, contractors, and basically they said, the contractor said, 
if the contra if a contractor is involved in the design he gets an insider view and that causes him to be a higher bidder so it's a disadvantage rather than an advantage again you can always hire a superintendent as retired or uh, what i used to do to basically try to prevent this kind of thing if i'm doing a project here i hire a contractor from regina or uh, saskatoon or vancouver or a superintendent to review the drawings and give me their opinion and i know that they will not bid on the project just to make things uh, easy and don't get into too much trouble number five reduce and control change orders one thing i want to make sure that owners understand change orders does make contractor life difficult believe me i work as a, as a contractor and i know what it means to have a change order when things are 70 80 percent it's major impact on the contractor operation. And that's why they come for more money. It interfered with the flow of the work. So please control change orders. Very, very important. Another very good area here, involve lawyers early to review contract document. I remember I was giving a, a design built uh, project uh, review in Calgary many years ago. And here comes, there was 25 people there. Uh, here comes one guy from the very end. He said, Dr. Fami, please tell people to involve lawyers early i said oh are you a lawyer sir he said yes I, but but you know putting the joke aside it, you know make sure that you involve lawyers in the contract and before that make sure that you know and understand the contract very critical make sure I, I remember when i was doing claims and all this here comes a project manager and they talk to me about the issue i say uh, the first question i ask is did you read the contract he said yes did you understand the contract he says no you need to under read and understand the contract it's very very important so make sure that the lawyer read the contract and bring to your attention any potential issues for claims involve them early rather than late make sure that you have a balanced contract one of the best contract i've ever seen is a federal government contract i worked with that contract for 30 years as a federal government employee it is a very balanced contract and it is fair to both parties the owner and the contract another very important and critical area is document 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 i remember being involved in claims for so long, for so many years, I got involved with uh, several uh, court cases and judges and so on. At uh, one time, the judge was so confused, he got two witnesses, both of them are engineers, and they are giving two different uh, facts. And the guy was, the judge was very confused. I said, look, I'm not going to take any views from you. I'm going to depend on what is in the 
file. So make sure that the file is complete. Make sure that the file complete. Okay. And I continue from my claim experience. Whoever has better documentation wins. So make sure uh, that you have better documentation. If you have a very large project, make sure that you assign uh, one person. I remember a few years ago, I was involved in a project, a very large project. And they asked me, what is your best advice? I said, my best advice have one or two people looking after documentation. Documentation is extremely important. And luckily, when the project ended, they have three huge claims. And uh, the owner was lucky to basically throw away two and paid half uh, the third one. So it does work. It does work. Again, what to document? Everything. Okay. Uh, again, to that, to what extent? That will depend on the issue. If it is not on paper, it did not happen. This is the auditor motto. I worked as a three years as an auditor or project reviewer. Just to review the project, does it really match uh, the rules and the conditions that the owner have and so on. Uh, make sure as a contractor to protect yourself and protect the owner to have uh, basically good daily logs, record everything. Who visited the site, when they visited, how much concrete did you pour, what work was done, what work was not done, and was planned to be done, and why, and so on. Another very important area is allocate risk to the right party. One question I always ask, who owns the risk? Who owns the risk? Can you answer maybe that this question? Do you guys have a minute? Just try it on the chat. You have. You probably don't have time. But anyway, please remember to assign the risk to the party that can control it. There is no use assigning a risk of soil conditions to the contract because the contract has no control over it. Very important, site conditions. The contractor has no control over it. And when you do that, the contractor will add money to the project. I remember we had a project uh, in Banff many years ago, and they received one bid. And our estimate or the owner estimate was five and a half million, and that bid came to eight and a half million, three millions more. And when we talked, like they talk to me and say, look, come and, uh, you know, meet with the contractor. I said, I know what you did. What they did, they basically pushed all the risk towards the contract. What do you expect from the contract? They will just raise the price up. That's, that's the only thing he can do or she can do. So please be careful when you are assigning risks. Another very important area is you may involve the contractor in the decision which risk to take and which risk not to take. Uh, in the University of Calgary, we did uh, research in that area. Another very good advice, minimize multiple contractors on site. Make sure you involve the legal folks in the department to uh, tell you 
make sure that who is responsible to pay the prime contract. That is another area that actually can create uh, delays and disputes. I am aware of three or four right now. Eleven, manage project conflict proactively. This is a beautiful statement. Make sure that you look ahead, take a risk management approach and say, it looks like this may create an issue. Let us resolve it now. Talk to the contractor, talk to the architect. Make sure that there is open communication between the two of them. Make sure that you get technical advice early rather than I need an answer by this afternoon. That will keep the job moving. And that is what the contractor wants. I'm sure as an owner, you notice as soon as the contractor is held for whatever reason and the progress is not moving as he expected the contractor gets upset because now their profit is online make sure that you are transparent don't hide anything because it will come out and now people will be very upset make sure that you stay within the negotiation atmosphere. When you are negotiating with the contractor or the contractor with the owner, you guys both in control and you need to look after each other. That's very important. Once it goes up and it goes into mediation, now a third person is coming in. Now an arbitration, somebody will make the decision on your behalf. Once it goes to court, you have no control anymore. And that has a major impact on the project and the harmony within the team. People start getting upset, relationship suffers, communication breakdown, and Unfortunately, this has a major impact on the project success. So please look ahead, have a risk management approach, and prevent rather than cure. The last one I wanted to cover is basically involve stakeholders as early as you can. And I'm talking mainly to owners. The owner that does not involve all the stakeholders will suffer a lot because they, when they get involved sooner or later, they will bring changes with them and that will create problems with the contract. So try to maximize stakeholder involvement, especially the users, especially the operating and maintenance people, especially the public, if the public is going to use the facility and so on. Make sure that they are involved. The, the traditional approach, I don't like it. The new approach that I am really suggesting is use partnering approach. Make sure that the operating and maintenance people are involved in the design and involved in the size of the mechanical room where equipment should go. Make sure that they talk to the mechanical engineer. Unfortunately, many of the mechanical engineers usually do things 
uh, in a theoretical sense. Some of them don't have any practical experience, and now the site will suffer and the operating maintenance people will suffer. Very, very important. Make sure that you involve them, make sure that they are part of the project. They are very important part of the project. Any questions? I left five minutes for questions. Okay, if there is no questions, let me just very quickly summarize what we covered here. Uh, here's an overview. We talked about owners and contractor attitude and approaches. Make sure that you improve communication with the contractor. Make sure that you produce a quality plan and specification early involvement with a contractor or a superintendent somebody that have experience on site or a construction manager reduce change orders as much as you can uh, make sure that they are in the front rather than towards the end of the project use contract administration best practices involve lawyers early document 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 have enough documentations allocate risk to the right party and we talked about the right party is the party that can control that particular risk minimize multiple contractor on site manage project conflict proactively that will put you in control of the project rather than running to resolve issues very very important key success factor and finally involve stakeholders as much as you can that includes users and operating and maintenance staff that's all i have all the best to you uh, Claims is an extremely important part of the construction operation and it needs to be addressed proactively. All the best and good luck.